Hi everyone, welcome to Dot Points P13, 18, 19, 20 and 21. So um, because these are all basically related to each other, um, I've put them all together um, to get them done more quickly. So let's have a look at uh, what these dot points involve. So P13 is investigating the complex interaction between the problem organism, host, environment and plant disease, also known as the um, pest or disease triangle, which um, you have seen before in animal production. Next, we need to define IPM. The next one, we need to outline IPM's ability to reduce the problem of pesticides um, and chemical resistance occurring. The next one, uh, 20, we need to research um, an IPM program for a plant production system. It's basically the same as what we did in animal production, but a different example. And then lastly, again, we've done this already in, in uh, animal production, but we need to ev evaluate an IPM program um, naming one target organism and the host of the plant. So for almost all of this, I've looked at um, cotton bollworm. So it's helpful if you um, read up a little bit about cotton bollworm, but um, we're going to learn a bit about cotton and cotton bollworm um, here in this uh, dot point, in this worksheet. So the cotton bollworm is here. We can see it here. It's um, scientific name or Latin name is Helicoverpa armigera. And basically it, it burrows inside the boll and this here is called a boll or B-O-L-L -L, of the cotton plant and this is the leaf and this is growing on top of the stem. And inside this boll is where the cotton grows and you can see uh, this is an example of a ripe cotton boll um, that hasn't been eaten, it's produced cotton and this is what this boll here looks like inside um, well, although now that it's had a uh, bollworm eat inside it, it's probably eaten out the cotton. So this, uh, when this one ripens and opens up, there may not be um, any, uh, there might be some, but not much cotton left in there because it's been eaten. So um, bollworm is a major problem for cotton producers and it needs to be controlled. So typically cotton producers use a really large amount of um, pesticide to kill them, insecticide to kill um, bollworm. Um, however, with new um, genetically modified versions of cotton, such as BT cotton or Bolgard, which we're about to learn about, um, they've been able to reduce their pesticide um, usage by up to 90%. And the reason is because the um, genetically modified plant produces a toxin um, from a bacteria that was taken from the soil. Um, so this bacteria that normally grows in soil produces a toxin which kills the um, bollworm. And so scientists have genetically modified um, BT cotton or Bolgard to produce this toxin from its leaves. And so it prevents the, um, it stops the, the bollworms from eating those plants and, and it minimizes or reduces, completely removes usually the um, need for you to spray for, to kill the bollworm. So moving on, uh, this is basically just giving you a bit of an outline of um, cotton in Australia. So it's kind of important to understand how we grow cotton and um, then it'll help you with the rest of the um, stuff. So you've done this kind of thing before with um, sheep blowfly. Uh, you did Lucilia caprina for the disease triangle. And um, so uh, this is gonna be our disease triangle um, of which cotton's gonna be part of it. Um, so let's have a look here. Cotton in Australia. So if you watch this video, it's really important that you watch these videos. They're only pretty short um, and it gives you an idea about cotton. But basically um, in Australia, we typically grow cotton from central Queensland down to the Victorian border. And you can see the map here. Uh, these are roughly the areas we grow cotton. Um, you generally need reasonable water, um, good soils, good deep rich soils and um, the correct temperature. So they can also stand a high summer temperature, which is why we see them um, in those places, why we see cotton in those places, particularly in Queensland. Um, you can or should use crop rotation and often with wheat and maize or something like that, which also grows well in the areas where cotton grows. Um, and that will help you to grow or to store soil water. And with the use of genetically modified cotton, such as Bolgard, um, there's been a 90% reduction so a lot of farmers have gone from spraying maybe 15 or 16 times per season, um, often down to zero need or zero sprays of pesticide, which obviously is beneficial uh, financially as well as for the environment. 
In terms of planting cotton, um, this this cotton example in um, in the video, oh, there's actually dry land and irrigated, but the ones I was talking about was dry land. So um, the ideal time to plant cotton depends on when the moisture in the soil is right and also the temperature of the soil, which needs to be around about 16 degrees Celsius. Um, you're planting roughly four to five plants per meter in a row. And um, you can use agronomists, uh, which are people that specialize in coming and consulting and telling you when you should do things and what you should do at the right time. In terms of picking, um, normally picking of cotton is outsourced to someone who has a harvester and they'll come onto different farms and harvest because um, the equipment's too expensive to own um, on your own. You, you wouldn't own it um, just to use it once a year or twice a year. So um, it's outsourced to someone else who would do multiple properties and it's important that they um, practice cleanliness to prevent spreading of pests and diseases from farm to farm. In terms of um, harvesting, so when you harvest um, or before you harvest, just before you harvest, you spray the, the crop with a herbicide um, and this kills the leaves and it removes the leaves kind of die and fall off um, the crop rather than getting it in the um, cotton. So when the cotton's being picked by the harvester, um, if you don't have leaves there, then it removes the chance of getting um, leaf matter rubbish into the um, cotton harvest, um, which is obviously beneficial for later on. And also when you're spraying that herbicide, you could spray another chemical, which is a bowl opener. So it actually, um, the bowl, which we saw here, um, if you spray a bowl opener, it will um, split open the bowl or help the bowl to split open. So you've got a higher yield of cotton if you spray that um, before being harvested. So we've already looked at the location of cotton in Australia. And um, this is probably the important part here because you're, you're going to talk a lot about biotechnology over a number of different dot points. And um, this uh, information here is really important. So biotechnology basically means cotton with a transgenic or genetically modified trait. So they're genes that have been brought in from other organisms. That's what transgenic means. Um, most yield gains, uh, so improvements in yield uh, recently have come from plant breeding. So choosing different varieties and breeding them together, but that also includes um, genetic modification. And so overall, up, um, there's different uh, versions of Bolgard. So there was first Bolgard 1, then Bolgard 2, and then now there's Bolgard 3. And so with Bolgard 2, uh, there's now been a 90% reduction in pesticide usage um, because the, um, the bowl worm is being killed by the toxin that the Bolgard cotton genetically modified is producing. Um, so basically, you can do a bit more research into Bolgard, but um, Bolgard 1 had one method of action of killing the boll worm. Bolgard 2 had two different ways of killing it, and Bolgard 3 has three different methods of killing the boll worm. Uh, and that's an attempt to help build up or to prevent the buildup of resistance because the more ways you have of killing something, the less chance there are any that are resistant to all of those methods. The next po important point is that GM cotton has led to about $395 million of extra income for the industry since 2010. So obviously that's a significant amount of money. Um, Australia, Mexico, and the US were the first countries to commercialize the biotechnology or the you know genetic modification of cotton in 96, 97. And today 99% or basically all cotton in Australia is genetically modified whilst only 60% of cotton worldwide is um, genetically modified and that's an important statistic too. For the uh, interaction between host pest and disease, um, I've changed this because this really is, this dot point really says host pest and disease. Uh, I have um, changed this to be um, black root rot. So what we are, what we've done here is the Laviopsis bassicola and so um, the this is, uh, you can summarize this as T. bassicola. So whenever you're putting a, um, whenever you are putting a Latin name for a pathogen, um, you can shorten it with the capital of the first word and the um, second second word. Um, so T. bassicola, if you just remember that, that's fine. Black root rot. And black root rot basically is a fungus, and this is identifying the problem organism here. It's a fungus which is dispersed in soil, but can attach, attach to tractor tires, etc., and move around. And um, it can survive years in the soil, but it can't grow on dead organic matter, um, only on living uh, plants, which is an important point here for control, that if you don't have any living plants or um, you have just organic matter and stubble left in the field, uh, it will not be able to survive. 
So T. bacicola is the pathogen. Um, Gossypium hirsutum, which is cotton, is the host. And the environment, the specific location is the soil and the roots of the cotton plant. So moving over, identifying the hosts is the cotton plant on the roots. Um, identify the occurrence and distribution. It's widespread throughout Australia. Um, the attempts to control it um, help or start with basically a come clean, go clean policy for people and machinery. So farms should um, farms should make sure that, that any machinery or people or trucks and cars, etc., that come onto their property if they're growing cotton and this is a problem in the area, that they're clean and that they don't have, um, you know, soil on there uh, or plant material and stuff like that that could spread um, black root rot. So as we mentioned, um, it's spread by moving plants or soil, and boots, et cetera, et cetera. And the symptoms and what it changes is it's gonna, be, it's gonna slow the growth rate and stunt the plants. Um, it, destruct, it destroys the root cortex and then causes the roots to go black, hence why it's called black root rot. And lastly, it reduces uptake of nutrients into plants and hence decreases photosynthesis and decreases um, NAR or um, net assimilation rate. So the plant will not put on as much um, vol or yield and therefore um, you won't, your yield will be lower. The next dot point, um, define IPM. So we should already know well and truly what IPM is, but um, we're doing it again here. Um, so from your prior knowledge and with research, define what IPM is. So IPM is the use of two or more control strategies. This is important here because um, it could just be two or it could be four, but um, it has to be two or more. Um, using just chemicals or using just physical or just biological on their own is not IPM. So two or more control strategies for a pest. This may include chemical, physical, biological, and cultural methods. For example, um, see over page. This is done to reduce the buildup of resistance. Okay, so the next dot point here. Outline IPM's ability to reduce problems of pesticide and chemical resistance in target organisms. So basically it's saying like, how is IPM able to stop resistance from occurring? And the answer is this. So because we're using multiple methods of control, resistance to chemical is re reduced um, because when you spray chemical on pests, um, some of them, most of them die, but some of them in the population have a natural resistance and they will survive. And so that means that um, those ones that survive then pass on their genes and more and more in the, in the resulting population um, are resistant. So um, basically you want to be able to kill those ones that are resistant with some other means. And that's what IPM does well is you use some other means, whether it be biological, physical, um, cultural, etc. Um, and you kill the organism that way that is resistant. So it can't pass on its genes. So Basically what ha happens is as chemical is used more and more on its own without other strategies, genetic diversity in pest population leads to resistant organisms surviving and multiplying. And so the use of other non-chemical methods can kill the resistant organisms. The example is a simple example with a fly trap, um, which is a physical method that will kill flies um, even if they are resistant to some chemical. And this means ultimately that the resistant individuals are no longer able to spread their resistant genes. And that's really the reason or the, the reason we use IPM and the ability of IPM to actually um, reduce resistance is because um, this is what happens and this is what you can do about it. Uh, the next question, uh, research an IPM program for plant production system. Um, read the information below. So Helicoverpa uh, or bollworm eats cotton from the bowl and leaves and it also eats the leaves on cotton or um, Gossypium hirsutum, G hirsutum for short, um, which obviously reduces yield. So how do we control that um, using an IPM strategy? Here's an example of an IPM strategy. Um, a chemical example could be sprays. Example, Prevathon. Prevathon is the name of a spray that you can use on bollworm. Biological, of course, we already know about BT cotton or Bolgard. Bolgard 2 is the current one and it kills bollworm with Bacillus thuringiensis. It's important that you know this. Um, you can just put B thuringiensis, thuringiensis for short, um, but it's a soil bacteria that is um, now produced by the plant because um, it is genetically modified and it kills the bollworm. An example of a physical method is pupae busting. So obviously they're um, a worm um, and so they grow in pupae in the soil 
And um, but if you plow the soil up to about 10 centimeters depth, that's where they live. Um, and so if you do that when they're in that stage of life cycle, then um, it's going to kill the um, pupae and then it's going to reduce the level of um, boll worm. The last one here is cultural. So an example of cultural uh, management strategy is weed management. So looking after the weed or preventing weeds because um, the boll worm can stay alive on by eating weeds um, in the time when you don't have cotton available. So the last dot point here is actually evaluating an IPM program and discussing how good or bad it is. And um, we've already talked about the IPM program, it's here. And I'm going to talk to you about or we're going to discuss why, um, whether it's good or not and give some reason why. And you can see here already that I've not only um, written, but I've also, I guess, underlined the key things that I want the market to pick out. So I want them to see that it's highly effective. There's a 90% reduction in pesticide usage that I know the scientific name of the um, pest. I know the scientific name of the plant. I also know the um, dollar saving or the increase in uh, you know revenue because of using GM cotton. And then lastly, there's another statistic here. 99% of our cotton is genetically modified, which shows that it's obviously pretty good if um, basically every farmer is using it. So this is a really good example of a um, just a full mark answer here for evaluating an IPM program because um, you know I've made it very, very clear to the markers and shown lots of criteria. So um, this is what it says. The IPM, IPM program described on the previous page is highly effective. This is primarily due to the fact that there has been up to a 90% reduction in pesticide usage since the introduction of Bolgard 2 in controlling bollworm or um, H. armigera. This has meant a significant increase in yields of the cotton host, uh, Gossypium hirsutum, of bollworm with over 395 million in additional income in Australia for cotton since 2010, as 99% of our cotton is now genetically modified. So that's an excellent answer. The past HSC questions. Uh, so this is kind of a related question, um, but it's a, it's a question 20, it's very hard, and um, it requires you to look at um, information across three tables here. So first of all, it says a vegetable grower has a number of strategies available to control a pest in a crop of cucumbers. Uh, the following information is provided to her. And then we have the yield of the cucumbers and the pest population. So as the pest population goes up, in, in other words, the moths per trap that they've collected. Um, so more and more moths means less and less yield, which drops off um, as you get more moths. And obviously the quality of the yield is probably going to go down as well. So here it's got um, the different treatments and it tells you what it does to the pest. Nothing, 30% of them killed, 80, 100, etc. And then the cost of putting that on. And then lastly, we have here the price that we're actually going to get depending on how much of the pest population, um, you know, how many moths there is. Um, if there's more moths, it's going to have poor quality produce and a lower, um, a lower price, $4 per box. Uh, if we have less, so kind of less than four, so up here, um, then we're going to get uh, $8 per box. So they're going to be premium instead of poor. So uh, we need to think of that as well. So... Let's start by, actually we'll read the question. Uh, the farmer measured the pest population in the cucumber crop at 25 moths per trap. Which of the strategies would be the most profitable to use on the cucumber crop? Okay, so first of all, there's 25 moths per trap. So this is where we are. And um, this here is um, the yield that we're going to get based on that. So we're going to get 50, um, 50 boxes and it's going to get you $200 per hectare. Now, what I've done here is you're going to get uh, 50 boxes per hectare and it's going to be 25 moths. So pest population, it's, ha it's higher than 20, 18, so it's 25. So you're going to get a f only $4 per box. And then if you get 50 boxes times 400, it's going to be 200. Um, and then we're not treating anything, right? Because if we're just selling it at that rate, we're not treating it um, and there's no cost to treat them. Okay, if we move up here, if we spray pest oil instead, let's say, um, this here is going to be pest oil. And so we'll kill 30% of them. And if you work out 30% with pest oil, 30% kill, 30% uh, less pests than 25 is going to be about 17. 
So that means we're going to get 175 or 180 boxes roughly per hectare. And if you calculate um, that, so there's going to be 17, so it's going to be good quality. You're going to get $6 per box times 180 boxes. So if you multiply that, it's going to be 1080, but we have to consider that we have to pay $200 for the treatment. So out of that 1080, you need to take off 200 and you get $880 per hectare. So obviously significantly more. So pest oil is definitely better. However, if we move on to soft insecticide and we kill 80%, um, it's going to be 80% kill rate of 25 moths is going to be more like about five. And so that's going to give us uh, 250 boxes um, and that's going to give us 250 times. So if they're five, they're going to be still good and $6 per box. Um, that's going to get us, uh, let's just calculate this here. It's going to be six times 250 boxes. It's going to be $1,500, but uh, we have to subtract $600 here um, because it's cost us $600 to spray it. So it gives us $900 per hectare. And then if we lastly use the um, hard insecticide, it's going to kill all of our moths, um, but it's going to cost us $1,200 to do it. Um, so we're still only going to get 250 boxes um, but we're going to have no moths. So the quality or the is going to be premium and we're going to get $8 per box times 250. That's going to give us um, $2,000. Um, $2,000, but we have to take off 1200 of the cost of the insecticide, which only gives us $800 per hectare. So you can see that um, $800 per hectare for the hard insecticide um, nine hundred dollars per hectare for the soft insecticide, and these these two are way lower. So the answer here is the soft insecticide is the best treatment. It's going to get you nine hundred dollars per hectare instead of eight hundred for hard insecticide, um, and eight eighty for pest oil, and two hundred dollars a hectare for no treatment. Moving on, um, we have a disease triangle here. So we have host, pathogen, and environment are the three things on the triangle there. What is the name given to organisms which cause disease? It is pathogen. And um, what is the best method for present preventing the development of resistance? It's implementing a range of chemical and non-chemical strategies. That is the only one that is IPM. That one is one method, that one is one method, and that one is one method. Um, so moving over here, I answer part A and B in relation to pest or animal plant disease. Um, outline an effect that this plant or animal pest and disease has on the productivity of the agricultural system. So the key thing here is the productivity. And the one I've chosen is bollworm. I put in H. armigera. Um, bollworm eats cotton out of the bowl of the plant and also the leaves. Um, this reduces photosynthesis. So this is talking about productivity here and NAR, hence yield losses. And it's estimated that it cost produces $2 billion before Bolgard GM cotton was introduced. Um, so that is an important statistic and that is clearly about the productivity. Uh, the, this question here describe the essential components um, of an IPM program. You need to really do all four. It's four marks. Chemical sprays such as Prevathon, biological BT cotton ex example Bolgard 2. This is just um, taken straight out of the previous page. Um, physical pupae busting, plowing down to 10 centimeters um, of soil and prevents overwintering and then cultural weed management to prevent bollworm overwintering on other plants. And so you can see I've just taken that straight from here. It's exactly um, the answer to that question. Um, okay, so predatory mites may be used to, to control red spider mite. What type of pest control is it? It's biological because you're using something else that's living. Um, this one is exactly the same as this one here. Um, and then Explain how IPM programs can reduce the problem of chemical resistance. So IPM uses multiple methods, including non-chemical, um, to kill organisms and hence slow or stop resistance buildup. As there is natural variation of genes in a population, um, some show resistance to chemical and survive and pass on genes. Therefore, using other non-chemical methods, such as pupae busting of bollworm with cotton, um, physical, resistant organisms can be killed and prevented from passing on resistant genes. So you can see the that is explaining the problem of chemical resistance and then talking about how um, IPM helps overcome it. And the last one here is, what is the best description of IPM? And this is only one method, this is only one method, this is only one method, and this one talks about multiple um, strategies. The key, word there is, key letter there is strategies with an S. Um, that is why that is IPM.